In 2004, I was a co-founder and the executive director of Berkshire Arts and Technology Charter Public School, also known as BART, in Adams, Massachusetts. We had a mission to propel students to college success, especially those students who weren't already on the path. In 2009, the Massachusetts Department of Education placed us on probation, citing previous poor test performance. They gave us one year to turn ourselves around. And then in 2011, we were named one of the 18 best charter schools in the nation by a program funded through the United States Department of Education. This is what those events look like through the lens of test data. Now, reasonable people might disagree about the value of standardized tests, but I think everyone can agree that a graph like this that goes up and to the right is a good thing. Our students made dramatic and sustained improvements in a very short period of time. In fact, this turnaround was so remarkable that multiple outside agencies, including Harvard's Graduate School of Education, came to study our story. I'm here today to share that story with you and to share the secret sauce for turning schools around. In fact, that part is actually remarkably simple. The secret to turning schools around is to believing every student can achieve, every student can be successful. It sounds easy, right? It's not. So let me go back. In 2004, when we were opening BART, we had a mission to prepare students for college and to focus on arts and technology integration throughout our curriculum. And we had a killer plan to execute on that mission. We recruited a diverse student body from our local districts, representative of our local districts. We hired a promising faculty. We built support services and we worked our tails off. It was a startup, we were excited, we were motivated to make a difference. And by 2007, any casual observer would have said we had a fully baked school. And yet, in 2007, when we looked at our student data, we could see our students were failing by the state standards. Sure, they were doing as well as the students in our local districts, but those districts were also failing. And the only reason the state granted us a charter was because they expected us. In fact, they insisted that we do better, and we weren't. We knew when the state came to visit and evaluate us in 2009, we faced closure if we didn't turn it around. I didn't know what to do, I didn't know where to begin, and honestly, I was petrified of failure. So we looked around, we found the best help we could, and in early 2008, we hired a team of education experts. They came back, they, they studied everything about BART, and came back with a list of recommendations to get our performance on track. Their report was comprehensive and included all the typical education jargon. We needed to differentiate our curriculum. We needed to adopt the workshop model. We needed to revise our discipline system. I can do those things. Those things have work plans, they have checklists, they have due dates, I can do that. But the team also told us that none of that work would be worthwhile if we didn't address the fundamental issue they saw in our school. They said, and I quote, you seem to be running a great social service agency with a side business in education. The adults here clearly care about your students, but they don't actually believe in their academic abilities. What? Of course we believed, of course we believed in our students. Who in the education business doesn't? And why were we working so hard if we didn't actually believe that our students would succeed? So they shared a few quotes with us that they had heard directly from our team. We have students who have significant disabilities. They've, they come from tough family homes. They're doing the best they can. We have some students willing to rise to the challenge of being here. The others, they just aren't committed. We thought we would get artsy students. These students aren't very artsy. They're the wrong students for our program. I had heard these sentiments expressed 
and honestly, I probably said some version of them myself. We had students with significant disabilities. We had students who had tough home lives. We had students who were thriving, and we had students who weren't. And we had students who didn't give a wit about arts and technology. But what I came to understand is that these quotes contained the implicit conclusion that we can't do any more for these students because these students have challenges in words spoken far too often in the education community that make them not college material. We were blaming our students for their failure. When that mirror was held up to us, when we had to look hard in that mirror, we could see that it was we, the adults, the administrators, and the faculty who were failing. So we were willing to do anything to turn our school around. But how do you embed a belief in students in every action in every decision, every single day. This is where the recipe for that secret sauce gets complicated. You see, I'm pretty sure that all educators begin their career with a belief in students. They should certainly espouse it when they say, and when we all say, children will rise to the expectations we set for them. But somewhere along the way, believing in students gets hard. That belief gets tested. And when that belief is tested, we start to lower our expectations. As a teacher, believing in students gets hard. <laughs> when, that stu when those students fail your exam and you gave them a study guide with all the questions in it. Or when that student slams her, her book shut and refuses to work for the fifth time that day. Or when you have spent your summer, your precious summer, designing your curriculum, attending classes, and your students don't care at all about your content. As an administrator, believing in students gets hard when you're spending your time addressing vandalism in the bathrooms, rowdy behavior on the bus, or those bullying reports coming into your office. Why can't these students just behave? So what's the alternative? Let me tell you a story about April. April was a teacher at BART in 2007 in her second year. She had two master's degrees, one in cultural studies, one in education. She chose to be a teacher because she believed that education could be the ticket out of poverty for so many students. Yet, she had been at BART for two years and she, she was working really hard and she was not seeing the success in her students that she expected. She thought she knew why. They came from poverty. They had disabilities like dyslexia and autism. She, though she cared deeply about her students, she thought the best she could do was help them make some difference, some gain. So in early 2008, when our principal, assistant principal and I stood up in front of the faculty and said, at this school, we believe in students. We believe in their ability to succeed, and if you don't, that's okay, but you need to find another place to work. April's internal debate was profound. She wanted to believe in students. She, she really cared about them. She wanted to believe it, but she had a hard time, hard time getting past the fact that they had these challenges. She couldn't see that they'd become proficient on the MCAS or graduate and get to college. She was, however, in her words, willing to suspend her disbelief. Before our talk, April had been focused on what is fair to expect of her students. Is it fair to expect a student with a 70 IQ to be proficient on the state exam? Is it fair to expect a student who's just been placed in her fifth foster home to participate in class? April didn't want to see, have her students experience failure, so she sought ways for them to find success in her classroom, even if it didn't help them meet the, the standards of the exam. Once she suspended her disbelief, once she said, okay, let's assume Sally can be proficient on this exam, she became an investigator. She became curious. She was willing to try new methods, measure their impact, reflect deeply on her teaching, and then change her, change her ways. 
when she looked at student data, she didn't ask, where are my students failing? She asked, how does my instruction need to change? How does my instruction need to improve? With that simple reframing, she took newfound responsibility for the students in her classroom and their performance. And when that happened, this is what she saw. Folks, that is 100% at the top. So for teachers, when they believe in students, true, deep, honest, and vulnerable belief, it fundamentally impacts the way they do their jobs. Teachers move from judging students by their strengths and weaknesses to setting consistent, high standards and then becoming entrepreneurial to help students meet those standards. Teachers who truly believe in their students are creative, curious, innovative, strategic, and collaborative. Stanford psychologist Carol Dweck calls this a growth mindset, a mindset based in the belief that one's basic qualities are dynamic and can be cultivated through hard work, through specific strategies, and through help from others, as opposed to a fixed mindset, which assumes that one's basic qualities are static and unchangeable. When a teacher truly believes in their students, they approach those students with a growth mindset about the students, but also about themselves. That teacher never assumes they already know how to address all the needs in a classroom. So when that student slams her book shut and refuses to work, the teacher doesn't send her out of class and blame it on her tough family life. The teacher starts by believing that student doesn't want to be disruptive. I mean, who does? But that teacher looks at that behavior as a symptom of a need. That teacher starts to try to find strategies to, to support that student. Some might fail, she knows that, but she keeps trying. That teacher doesn't judge the student by her behavior or by her academic accomplishments, but sees that student as a work in, prog a work in progress and sees herself as that student's developmental partner. And when that happens, students start to develop a growth mindset for themselves, too. So at one level, this might be simple, but it's still not easy. A key component of our secret sauce, of the secret sauce we know works, is that teachers cannot do this alone. Teachers must have the support of an organization behind them, one that similarly believes in students and one that supports teachers who share that growth mindset. So what does that look like? Leaders need to be specific and clear about their beliefs in students. It's not, we believe in all students. It's, we believe that each and every student can achieve this particular outcome, and it is our job to make that happen. At BART, that meant developing clarity around our mission statement. We prepare all students for college. And then developing the metrics to ensure we are on the pathway to get there. And we had to be relentless in communicating this to our team and to ourselves. And then just as the teacher needs to become a diagnostician in their classroom with their students, leaders need to become diagnosticians for the school and the faculty with a clear goal in place, a way to measure progress, a deep belief that every student can get there with the right supports, Administrators can begin to understand what systems and supports need to be added, changed, tweaked, or thrown out. Let me give you an example of a system we needed to redesign at BART. Discipline. Like most schools, our discipline system was based on negative consequences for bad behaviors. We had detentions, suspensions, expulsions. Like most schools, our discipline system was based on the belief that children will misbehave. And I'm a parent, I get it. When we looked at our student discipline data, we could see there were some students who kept misbehaving regardless of how many consequences they received. So it was pretty easy to conclude there's something wrong with these students, right? But when we stepped back, and when we said, what do we need to do differently to support these students? We know that they can succeed. What do we need to do differently? We created something new. We designed and implemented restorative practices. 
we developed new social and emotional behavioral supports for our students. And what did we see from those efforts? In a short period of time, we saw a 30% decrease in office referrals, a 50% decrease in failed classes, and a 15-point increase in academic proficiency. So leaders must hold tight to that belief in students as they design the right curriculum, the right schedule, as they choose the right faculty and staff. But more importantly, leaders must be deliberate about developing a school culture that drives that growth mindset for everyone. So, ooh. so why am I here today sharing this with you? Because you need to be a part of that secret sauce too. Students and teachers need your support behind them. I ask you to challenge yourself and those around you to change our collective dialogue from some version of these kids can't make it to what do we need to do to help these children succeed. Children need to be surrounded by adults at, at school, at home, at the mall, on the playground, by adults who truly believe in their ability to be better, to do better, to grow, and to succeed. When that belief permeates our culture, when that belief is evident in our daily conversations, in our school budgets, at the voting booth, we will all see a difference in our schools. Thank you.